In this lesson, we're going to talk about the Internet's architecture and some of the protocols. As you might recall, we talked about the Internet back in Unit 2, where we learned that the Internet and the World Wide Web were distinct things. One way to think about that is the Internet is the hardware that runs applications like the World Wide Web, which is software. In this lesson, we're going to talk about basic Internet architecture, packet switching, which is how information is routed through the Internet, the TCP IP protocol, which manages the traffic through the Internet, as well as how the Internet is organized into different abstraction layers. Let's start with, first, how is the Internet connected together? As you might recall, the Internet is really a network of disparate networks, signified here by the different colored local networks. The different colored dots are the host computers on the network, and they're connected by routers, which are special purpose computers that deliver messages through the Internet. The Internet uses a basic end-to-end -end architecture. Messages are sent from, say, a host A to a host B, but messages have to travel through one or more routers, depending on where these two hosts are located. And hosts are simply computers that are connected to the Internet. So that could mean your laptop or your smartphone or tablet. And hosts are given IP addresses or Internet protocol addresses. And they're reachable either by means of their IP address or by their domain name. For example, the host trincal.edu, the main computer for Trinity College, has this domain name and this IP address. And we're going to learn a lot more about how that works in a subsequent lesson. Routers, compared to hosts, are dedicated computers that transmit data between networks within the Internet. We can use the ping activity, which we learned about in a previous lesson, to try reaching some hosts on the Internet. Here's an example of a utility called NetworkTools.com that we can use. The picture shown here is demonstrating how we use it to do ping. So as you notice, Network Tools has a bunch of tools that you can select here. The one you want to select for this activity is the ping utility. Basically, you put in the domain name of the computer you're trying to reach or the host you're trying to reach and click the Go button, and it will display this information here. One thing it shows you is the IP address for that host, and then it shows you that it has sent a number of packets to this IP address, and it's reporting on the round trip time it takes for a packet to reach that host and then for the host to reply back that it's received it. And it then shows you here what the average latency for the round trip was for that particular ping. You might want to pause the video here and try that. Okay, hopefully you enjoyed that activity and we'll, we're going to use ping some more after this presentation. Let's now talk about how data travels through the internet. It uses a protocol called packet switching. And imagine you're sending an email to your friend, and it's a long email. Your email application is going to hand that off to a protocol that's going to break that message into fixed size, relatively small packets. So those are P1, P2, P3 here. Those packets are going to be sent through the internet to the destination. So this is the source, your computer, let's say, and this is your friend's computer. And notice that the packets can take different routes through the network. When they arrive at their destination, of course, they have to be gathered together there and then reassembled. And there's no guarantee they're going to arrive in the order P1, P2, P3. But they have to be reassembled in that order in order for you to read them. Why is this protocol used? The story goes back to the Cold War in the 50s when we were worried about nuclear attacks from enemies like the Soviet Union. And the desire was to create a network architecture that could withstand a nuclear attack or a similar disaster, which is why the idea came up for a decentralized network with multiple paths between any two points, A and B. And then you would simply divide the message into small packets and route them independently, where each router along the path simply forwards the packets to another router along the path. This sort of design and in this redundancy that you get by being able to have multiple paths through the network it leads to a network that can withstand various kinds of outages and disasters. So, for example, compare a centralized network where all the messages have to go through a central server or central router. What happens if that router gets knocked out? Well, you can no longer communicate on that network. You've broken the entire network. Compare that to a decentralized network, such as this one. One path between A and B is shown in red here. Now, if 
nodes get knocked out, you can still find a path from A to B. This redundant routing capability gives the network a robustness that you don't have with a centralized network. One misconception that is frequently found about the internet is when you're browsing a website or sending an email or talking on the phone through your smartphone, it might seem to you like you have a, a channel between, the, between you and your destination. Well, that's not the case. Packet switching is not like what's called circuit switching, which is the kind of switching that was done when we used landlines to communicate. In circuit switching, you actually do have a channel that remains constant throughout the call between the receiver and the caller. That's a dedicated channel. Only the caller and receiver are on that channel. In a packet switch network, there is no such sustained connection. And each individual packet, each little voice packet when you're talking on the phone is being shipped through the internet along multiple routes. What seems to you to be a continuous connection is the impression that is given by the technology you're using, which makes it look that way. Let's now look at another network utility called trace route that lets us trace how packets are routed through the internet. You can also get to this through the network tool site. And this time you want to select the trace tool. And suppose I want to trace packets as they travel between network tools and MIT. I put in MIT, I click go, MIT.edu, and it shows me MIT's IP address. And then the source is the trace route server. The destination is MIT's IP address. Now what we're seeing here is packets as they're being routed through different routers and computers on the network. This particular trace required eight hops, okay, to go from here to there, from the source to the destination. If you do this repeatedly, you'll see that the, the eight hops aren't always exactly the same. In fact, there could be more or fewer than eight. So you might want to try using NetworkTools.com to trace some the routes to different addresses. And here's some you can try if you want to pause the video here. OK, here's a question. Does the geographical location of the computers and routers on the internet affect latency? That is, does it affect the time it takes a message to go from its source to its destination? That's an interesting question. And what we're going to do here is we're going to pause and we're going to explore this using these network utilities that you've learned about, ping and traceroute. And we're going to do a pogle activity to explore this question.